So I think you'll find chapter 17 um, relatively simple compared to um, some of the previous chapters we've talked about, some of the vertical tract um, things. So yay, <laughs> That's, enjoy it, it's refreshing. Um, so we talked about peripheral nerves in the last section, now we're gonna talk about dysfunction of the peripheral nerves, because that's how we roll. So <laughs> the learning objectives for this are, I want you to be able to distinguish between mononeuropathies multiple mononeuropathies and polyneuropathies, um, and to name an example of each, and we will go through that. Um, I also want you to know the signs and symptoms, pathology et and etiology for carpal tunnel syndrome, also known as CTS. Um, it's a pretty common, actually, carpal tunnel syndrome. It's pretty common. So um, the signs of peripheral nerve damage can include sensory, autonomic, and motor damage. Um, all of the symptoms are gonna show up in a peripheral nerve distribution. So they're not gonna be in a dermatome distribution. They're not gonna be in a myotome distribution. They're gonna be in a peripheral nerve distribution. So um, sensory changes include decreased or lost sensation, um, abnormal sensations like we've talked about in previous chapters, including hyper hyperalgesia, dysesthesia, paresthesia and allodynia. So stuff doesn't feel right, things are more painful. Um, sensations that wouldn't ordinarily be painful are painful. Sensory changes. Autonomic changes, um, the signs will depend on the pattern of axonal dysfunction. So if there's a single nerve that's damaged, signs are usually observed only if the nerve is completely severed, those autonomic changes. Because of the way the autonomic nervous system functions, um, there are other nerves that are going to um, help a little bit. If the nerve is completely severed, um, you might see some signs. Um, if a lot of nerves are damaged, um, problems may include difficulty regulating blood pressure, heart rate, sweating, bowel and bladder functions, and impotence. So if people come in um, and they report to you bowel and bladder functions, that should be a red flag, and we will talk about red flags in the spinal system. Like there's something going on here, and we need to uh, send them back to their doctor to figure this out. So the kind of motor changes you'll see, um, if you have peripheral nerve damage um, in a motor nerve, you can get paresis or paralysis. Um, if the muscle is denervated, um, EMG recordings show no activity for possibly uh, plus or minus a week after the injury. Um, so right after um, a, nerves, a nerve denervation, you get no um, electrical motion, uh, no electrical um, response in the muscle. And when you get no electrical response in the muscle, muscle atrophy progresses rapidly. Um, the muscle fibers begin to develop a generalized sensitivity to um, acetylcholine along the muscle membrane, and that's where you get fibrillation. So fibrillation is not diagnostic of a specific lesion, but it is diagnostic of a, um, a problem in the um, innervation of the muscles. So... Um, um, fasciculation, which is that visible uh, quick twitch of muscle fibers, um, you can see that on the skin surface, but fibrillation cannot be observed on the skin surface. It's always abnormal, but it's not diagnostic of any specific lesion. So when you get um, denervation, you get trophic change, what's called trophic changes. And when the nerve supply is interrupted, you get muscle atrophy, the skin becomes shiny, um, the nails can become brittle, and subcutaneous tissues thicken. So um, you get a certain look that they describe um, with the trophic changes. Um, you also get, can get ulceration of cutaneous and subcutaneous tissues. You see this with um, polyneuropathies, and we'll talk about that in a minute, so diabetic polyneuropathy. Poor healing of wounds and infections, and um, neurogenic joint damage can happen, secondary su to blood supply changes, loss of sensation, and lack of movement. So one of the things, um, one of the sort of end stage trophic changes 
um, with the neurogenic joint damage. It's called Charcot foot, and it's very distinctive. It's almost like the um, joints in the foot collapse completely. Um, really interesting. I've seen um, several people with Charcot foot. They do do surgery to try to repair it at times, but um, it's uh, kind of a procedure of last resort. Really interesting. All this happens from denervation. So the denervation can be um, from a traumatic um, injury or it can be from a metabolic or ischemic injury. So um, when we're classifying neuropathy, um, when we talk about peripheral neuropathy, it means it involves a peripheral nerve and neuropathy, it's basically disease of a nerve. So a very vague sort of term. So neuropathy can mean a lot of things. And it can involve a single nerve, several nerves, or many nerves. So when we talk about a mononeuropathy, um, this is um, a neuropathy that involves a single nerve, and it's considered a focal dysfunction or focal lesion. So that can be like a single nerve compression or single nerve severance um, from a traumatic injury. Um, multiple mononeuropathy involves several nerves, and it's multifocal. And it's usually asymmetrical, um, involving individual nerves. So it's not, it's not going to be on both sides. It's not going to be um, in a symmetrical pattern. Polyneuropathies involve many nerves. And it's a generalized disorder that typically has a distal and symmetrical presentation. And we'll talk more about each one of these. So um, when you get a traumatic injury to a peripheral nerve, that is often the cause of a mononeuropathy. So various types of trauma may um, injure peripheral nerves. And depending on the severity of the damage, traumatic injuries to peripheral nerves are classified into three categories. There is a really nice chart on page 331 in the book that lays these babies out in a very nice way. <laughs> and I really like it. So um, the three categories of um, traumatic mononeuropathy are myelinopathy, axonopathy, and severance. So with myelinopathy, you get demyelination. Um, the recovery is typically pretty quick and complete because the nerve itself, the axon itself, isn't severed um, or damaged. It's the myelin that's damaged. And so um, it heals by remyelination. Um, traumatic axonopathy is where you actually get um, axonal damage. And the recovery is slow. The axon has to regrow. But um, there's a good recovery because the Schwann cell and connective tissue sheaths remain intact. So a lot of times these are like traction injuries and that sort of thing where the axon is stretched beyond its tensile um, ability, but you still have, it still has the Schwann cells and the connective tissue sheaths, so it has a path to regrow in, and so you get good recovery from that. Um, with traumatic severance, both the axon and the myelin are damaged. Um, the recovery from this is typically slow with poor results because um, you don't have that uh, guide for the axon to grow back if the myelin and the tissue sheath are both damaged. So you get inappropriate innervation, and sometimes you get um, traumatic neuroma, which is a growth on the nerve. Not good. So here's our traumatic myelinopathy. Uh, it's the loss of myelin that's just limited to the site of injury, so it's considered a focal lesion. Um, peripheral myelinopathies interfere with the function of large diameter axons, right? Because they, you get that, um, either you get crosstalk or you get um, just poor nerve conduction. So a focal compression of a peripheral nerve causes traumatic myelinopathy, like um, carpal tunnel syndrome is a traumatic mono myelinopathy, um, yeah, mononeuropathy, myelinopathy. Um, repeated mechanical stimuli can also cause focal compression. So um, this picture is from the book where um, it's, it's the myelin stain again, so the myelin shows up dark. The first one is a healthy nerve, and you see the little um, sort of break in the myelin. That's the node of Ranvier right there. And um, 
the in picture B, you get um, segmental demyelination, and it's severe enough to cause um, some axonal degeneration in this one. So there's actually interruption of the nerve. Um, there's another picture in the book, which I will let you look at, um, where it's it's a nerve being remyelinated. So um, with these kind of injuries, um, you do recover because the myelin can be replaced by the Schwann cells, which is great. So carpal tunnel syndrome, it's a compression injury of the median nerve in the space between the carpal bones in that carpal tunnel. And um, the flexor retinaculum um, or the transverse carpal ligament go right across the top of the carpal tunnel and compress the nerve. Um, Carpal tunnel um, syndrome can be more prevalent in people whose occupations require working in a cold environment or gripping of vibrating tools, like if you operate a router or um, some other tools that vibrate, it can um, cause a lot of uh, trauma in that area. So you can see in this picture, um, the person's left hand, which is on the right in this picture, just make it interesting because they're upside down from us, you can see the atrophy of the um, thenar muscles and their right hand, the thenar muscles have normal muscle bulk. So a lot of times because those muscles are innervated by the median nerve, um, if, it's, uh, if it's allowed to go on as long you can get atrophy of those muscles. So of course um, there is surgery for carpal tunnel and the, as they, over the years as they keep developing it, it becomes less and less invasive now um, it's just a tiny little incision that they do and they um, surgically transect the um, transverse carpal ligament and a little bit of the flexor retinaculum. So I've seen people that had really good results from carpal tunnel surgery and people that had not so good results from carpal tunnel surgery, but I think the not so good were done more in the past. I think the surgery has come a long way. So um, traumatic axonopathy um, disrupts axons and Wallerian degeneration um, and it occurs distal to the lesion. So the degeneration comes from the fact that the neuron's not getting any nourishment because it's severed, because the axon is severed. Um, axonopathies affect all sizes of axons. So um, you get um, reduced reflexes or significantly reduced or absent reflexes, somato sensation, and motor functions. So if you if you damage the axon, that causes a huge problem. But regenerating axons are able to reinnervate appropriate targets because the myelin and connective tissues remain intact. So it's like they have that pathway um, to heal, which is really super cool. And remember, axon regrowth goes at a rate of a millimeter a day. So recovery from axonopathies is slow, but it's generally good because the connective tissue and myelin sheaths provide guidance and support for those new sprouting axons. So usually um, you get traumatic axonopathies from crushing of nerves, um, dislocations, or closed fractures. So severance occurs when the nerves are physically divided by excessive stretching or laceration. So um, the axons and connective tissue are completely interrupted, causing immediate loss of sensation and muscle paralysis in the area that's supplied by that nerve. Um, Wallerian degeneration, which is the death of the cells um, of the soma, begins distal to the lesion three to five days later. Um, and then axons in the proximal stumps begin to sprout. So if the proximal and distal nerve stumps are close together, and there's not scarring in the way, um, some sprouts are guided to the target tissue in the periphery. However, um, because peripheral nerves are mixed often with um, motor and autonomic and sensory tissues, um, sometimes you get inappropriate um, reconnection. So it's you get, you, you get the um, nerve regrowth connecting to something that it wasn't connected to before, and that results in poor recovery. So you might get a motor axon innervating a Golgi tendon organ, um, so then the motor neuron fires, but the tendon organ can't respond the way a muscle can, so the connection would be non-functional. 
So um, if the stumps are displaced or if scar tissue intervenes between the stumps, um, the sprouts might grow into a tangled mass of nerve fibers, which is uh, called a traumatic neuroma. Um, and it's basically a tumor, it's not a cancerous tumor, but it's a tumor of axons and Schwann cells. And nerve conduction distal to the injury may never return because there's just poor regeneration, um, which is, you know, that's the worst case scenario on your peripheral nerve injuries, on your mononeuropathies. So multiple mononeuropathies involve two or more nerves in different parts of the body. So vasculitis might cause multiple mononeuropathy. Um, so really, if, if you suspect vasculitis in a patient, you really need to refer them to the neurologist um, because they, uh, they need to, more evaluation. Um, but individual nerves are affected in a mono, uh, multiple mononeuropathy, and it produces a random asymmetrical presentation of signs. So a lot of times it's that inflammation, that inflammatory process that is causing this problem. With polyneuropathy, you get symmetrical involvement of sensory, motor, and autonomic fibers that often progress from distal to proximal. That's considered the hallmark sign of a polyneuropathy. And they, um, that distal to proximal um, progression is often called a sock and glove um, presentation. You can see in the picture here, it's like he's wearing socks and gloves because um, it affects symmetrically the most distal areas of the extremities. So um, the uh, degeneration of the distal part of long axons occurs because of inadequate axonal transport to keep the distal axons viable. So um, usually the symptoms appear first in the feet and then the hands um, because those are the areas of the bodies that are supplied by the longest axons. So polyneuropathies are not the result of trauma or ischemia. Um, they are usually more the result of uh, metabolic issues. So in severe polyneuropathy, um, people lack sensation, and so they can't tell if they have an injury on their foot. Um, it also affects their balance. Um, they can get the neurogenic joint damage and poor healing in the affective part. So. Um, it can be toxic, you know, exposed to toxic chemicals, metabolic as in um, diabetic polyneuropathy or autoimmune. Um, and so the, the immune system is involved. So the most common um, causes include diabetes, nutritional deficiencies, secondary to alcoholism and autoimmune diseases. So um, there are a lot of different um, toxins, environmental toxins, um, and medications and nutritional disorders that can cause polyneuropathies. It is super common to see, though. Um, when you see um, polyneuropathies, diabetic polyneuropathy is really common. People's balance is affected. Um, you, it's really important to educate them regarding monitoring and caring for the insensitive areas. So in diabetic polyneuropathy, the axons and the myelin are damaged, and it usually doesn't come back. You don't, you don't usually get sensation back. Um, you get decreased sensation along with pain, paresthesias, and dysesthesias. Um, so in PT, we often are working on balance and strength training to reduce falls risk in people with diabetic neuropathy. Gait and balance do improve with exercise. So even though there's not a medical or surgical treatment for it, um, physical therapy can be a good treatment for diabetic neuropathy, and there's some good research to support this. So just because your um, sensory system and uh, your motor system are compromised doesn't mean that you can't still improve in some ways. So um, I always say to people with neuropathy, I'm like, well, if you can't feel your feet, try to feel with your knees can't feel with your knees, try to feel with your hips. So you have to work with what you've got <laughs> with um, diabetic polyneuropathy. So it's not just the peripheral systems that are involved with uh, neuropathy. It's also um, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, etc., etc. 
um, autonomic. So um, diabetes is a terrible disease. <laughs> um, it can really wreak havoc on your body. So the, you can get idiopathic polyneuropathy. Um, often older people without diabetes also develop peripheral, peripheral neuropathy. Among people over 60 with polyneuropathy, um, 10 to 18 percent of them are idiopathic, which is absolutely no cause. Sometimes you'll see um, people uh, people with um, idiopathic polyneuropathy, particularly when they walk, they sort of have a slapping gait. Their foot just slaps down because they don't have that sensation. It's a um, pretty distinctive um, gait pattern. In um, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which we talked a little bit about, um, you know, way back when in chapter five or six, um, it's the poly it's a polyneuropathy, but it's and it's an autoimmune polyneuropathy. It's characterized by more severe effects on the motor system than on the sensory system, um, and the paresis may be worse proximally. So you get rapid onset with progressive paralysis. Um, urgent diagnosis and treatment is required to prevent respiratory failure. So um, the diaphragm being innervated by the peripheral nervous system, um, that can be affected in gambaritis. So a lot of times when people are um, in um, ICU on a respirator in the initial acute stage of gambaritis, so um, one third of people with GBS require a ventilator to stay alive. So the good news is that there is good recovery from Guillain-Barre. As long as people get the right support, um, there's good recovery. And I've worked with several people with Guillain-Barre who've had fantastic recoveries. And because and of course they lose the um, their uh, motor uh, control distally to proximally, and then they get it back proximally to distally. So a lot of times we're working on strength, balance, gait, all that good stuff that we're so good at in PT. There is another, um, there's a hereditary genetic motor and sensory neuropathy which is known as Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. You'll see um, Charcot in the name of a lot of diseases. There was a French neurologist in the 1800s um, named Charcot and he named a lot of stuff after himself. <laughs> <laughs> and Marie Tooth are the other two neurologists that were working on it. It doesn't have anything to do with your teeth. It's somebody's name. So um, CMT usually causes paresis of muscles distal to the knee, resulting in foot drop, a steppage gait, and frequent tripping and muscle atrophy. So you can sort of see in this picture how that guy's foot has sort of a high arch look. Um, and... Usually they don't have a lot of numbness, numbness, but they get that muscle atrophy. And I have worked with a couple people with CMT, and therapy involves stretching, strengthening, conditioning, um, joint muscle and skin protection, and sometimes um, helping them find the right assistive device. Um, get, just really getting them on a regular stretching and conditioning program is super important for people with CMT. Most people who have CMT know they have it, not everybody, but most people, um, because it runs in their family. It's hereditary. Um, so we talked about myasthenia gravis when we were talking about um, the actions at the synapse. It's an autoimmune disease that damages acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction, and repeated use of a muscle leads to increasing weakness. Um, so th that, you know, with um, myasthenia gravis, we have fewer receptors. Um, we, the, but, uh, the botulism causes interference with the release, uh, release of acetylcholine from the motor axon. Um, it, so that's a, it's a um, bacterial infection, but you can also use the um, Botox or um, botulin toxin to um, inhibit muscles when you want to inhibit muscles. People use it cosmetically to, um, I guess they inhibit the muscles in their face so they don't get as many wrinkles. That just seems silly to me, but whatever. <laughs> but when you have someone who has an upper motor neuron lesion, like um, CP or after a stroke, um, botulinum toxin can be um, injected into the um, muscles with an increased amount of spasticity to decrease spasticity, and it can really help a lot.
So um, the botulinum toxin it, um, interferes with the um, synaptic vesicles um, merging with the um, membrane at the axon, axon terminal and releasing um, the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. So in a, an upper motor neuron lesion where you have excessive release of acetylcholine and excessive muscle spasticity, it can slow that down and decrease the spasticity. So um, even though the bacterium is, it would be a bad thing to be infected with it, um, it can be helpful in a therapeutic situation. So pretty cool. Uh, myopathy are muscles that are, are disorders that are intrinsic to muscles. So it doesn't really have anything to do with the nerve. It's actually a, a muscle disorder. Um, sensation and autonomic function remain intact because the nervous system's not affected by myopathy. So when we're talking about things like muscular dystrophy, um, coordination, muscle tone, and reflexes are unaffected until the muscle atrophy becomes so severe that, the, that muscle activity can't be elicited. So um, this is a picture, and I don't think this one's in the book. I got this one someplace else. Let's see, do I have the reference at the bottom of the picture? <laughs> anyway, I'll get you the reference. But um, this is a cross-section of a gastroc muscle in someone with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And you can see the little red blobs are the um, muscle fibers. And there are areas where the muscle fibers have been completely replaced by adipose tissue. And so you can see how that muscle just wouldn't work very well. 